How many times have you heard this in a sermon from the Bible? How many times have you preached this in a sermon? Faith in Greek is pistis, which means fidelity or trust. In Hebrew, the word usually translated as faith is emunah, which means steadfastness or fidelity. Or how many times have you, have you heard or said this? The Greek word here, ployon, can be translated ship or perhaps more accurately, boat. I'd like to make a case that these kinds of comments, explicit mentions of Hebrew and Greek, are mostly unnecessary and sometimes counterproductive. I'm here to counsel you Bible teachers out there, generally speaking, not to make explicit mentions of Hebrew and Greek words. This video is based rather heavily on an article that I wrote at the Logos blog, but I got a fair bit of pushback on that blog post, probably more than I've ever gotten on any of the 200 plus articles that I've written for Logos. And I want to take a second crack at the same basic material. Frankly, I feel after looking over the responses that my tone was off. I let some frustration and arrogance come through. I also had two guys, first a respectful critic and second a friend of the channel, Hebrew expert Mike Tisdell, alert me to something important that I had overlooked and I'll share it with you. So you viewers of my channel are going to get an edited version of the same basic argument I made. Hopefully sans, that means without snootiness. Boy, that was a bad choice. And with an extra insight provided by friends. I think it's pretty important that you watch toward the end, all the way to the end of this video, because many readers who were critical of my original piece did not seem to take note of the caveats that I gave at the end. Mike Tisdell said this to me too. This time then, I'm gonna give those caveats at the beginning so no one can miss them. Also, I think it's important to hear me say clearly that it's explicit mentions of Hebrew and Greek words that I'm trying to decrease. It's not the use of Greek in Hebrew, it's explicit mentions. Also, I was a bit shocked and dismayed that some people thought I was saying that they shouldn't use Hebrew and Greek in their sermon prep. This is most certainly not what I meant to say, and I sure hope it wasn't my fault. If I told others not to use Hebrew and Greek in the study, I'd be the biggest hypocrite and the biggest fool. There are indeed instances when it's useful to mention Hebrew and Greek words in the pulpit. Here are the two that I originally gave, plus that bonus one I stupidly didn't think of. And do you like this reflection? Isn't that kind of cool? Ooh. There are occasionally times when a literary device in the Hebrew or Greek, one that doesn't carry well into English, is worth mentioning in a sermon. A literary device is the kind of thing that careful lay Bible readers will encounter in the footnotes in their study Bibles and even in non-technical commentaries like the Tyndale series that I love so much, like Derek Kidner's stuff. So equipping people to expect and process such things is certainly not bad. I'm gonna give an example from one of the sermons of my own, excellent pastor, trained well at the Master's Seminary. The King James translators rendered every instance of the word meno, uh, that root in John 15, with the same English word, abide, except for three of the references. Can you spot them in this image? I have corresponding words turned on in my visual filters in Logos Bible software. I found all these by clicking on just one of them, a nice feature that I use regularly. I could imagine a preacher wanting to make clear that Jesus is, in the second paragraph, that's verses 11 and following, picking up on the theme of the first. You could preach, Jesus spoke these things that his joy might remain in his disciples, and that word remain is, in Greek, the same as the word abide in verses 1 through 10. I can see some value in doing this, and even in naming that Greek word meno. I would encourage you to read your audience. What if for everyone in your church who cements the contextual connection in his, his or her mind, because you mentioned Greek, there will be nine lepers who will not come and thank you after the sermon because they just got confused. Make sure that a significant percentage of your people will be able to follow that argument that you're making. Maybe this doesn't need to be said, but I used to preach to a group of functionally illiterate people. I loved them dearly, and they had many skills, as I always like to say, because it's true. But I think that making such a point would have been bewildering to them because reading was not one of their skills. And for what it's worth, pointing out what's going on in the Greek here runs somewhat counter to the advice of the King James translators themselves who said in their preface quite clearly that they refused to be tied to a uniformity of phrasing. They didn't think they had to use the word abide all throughout that passage if meno occurred in every place. They thought that this kind of insistence on consistency savored more of curiosity than of wisdom. What they said about translation, I say about preaching. 
if you can't demonstrate a given point through appeal to the English translations in your hearer's laps. I get this from Rod Decker, the great late Rod Decker. Think twice, maybe three times, before appealing to the Greek. But I don't want to be doctrinaire here. I've given a counterexample, another circumstance in which I might willingly name a Hebrew or Greek word in a sermon is when that word has effectively become an English one already. Here are some such words that I can think of just kind of off the top of my head. I'm sure more could be given. I'd love to see them in the comments. And some of them appear in English Bible translations. Agape, Hallelujah, Hosanna, Shaol, Tartarus, Hades, Ereba, Negev, maybe Mahar Shalahal Hashba as the son of Isaiah. If the translation that you are preaching from uses any of these transliterations, you almost certainly need to explain them. I can't think of anything wrong with doing that. You're helping people read their English Bibles, though I do tend to think it is punting for translators to transliterate most words other than proper names. And I was persuaded by one of my favorite King James Onlyists that probably Shaol ought to be translated. Why should you have to explain these things? Why couldn't they at least try to put them into English? I happen to believe that agape should not be an English word. I wish it weren't. I wrote a whole dissertation that aimed at a better explanation of the meaning and use of that word agape in the New Testament than what I commonly hear among Bible interpreters. But it's impossible for me to explain all of that without using the word agape, so I just did agape. I might add the names of God and Christ here. These feel to me like special cases in which it's truly beneficial to understand the interplay between Hebrew and Greek, Old Testament and New. There is some theology baked into these words. So Messiah, Christ, you could say Mashiach and Christos. You could say Jesus, Jesus, Elohim, God, Yahweh. A well-rounded Christian probably ought to know these proper names and their meaning, or in the case of Yahweh, our best guesses as to that meaning. And a third reason to mention Hebrew and Greek words explicitly in the pulpit was provided by the two readers that I mentioned. Here's what one of them said. I respect Brother Mark, but I think this left out a rather obvious exception category. I'm taking an exegetical Greek course right now. I assume this is a distance thing at some seminary. And our textbook, Greek is Great Gain by Dr. William Larkin, also says that on text critical matters, that an alternate reading can justify reference to the original language. I admitted after this comment on Facebook, as I admit to you now, that I should have mentioned text critical matters in my original piece at the Logos blog. This was a significant oversight on my part. I don't know that you need to mention Hebrew and Greek words explicitly, even to explain textual critical matters, of course, at least not in every case, but I want to leave some room there. For example, one variant pair in the manuscripts of the Greek New Testament is hupalambano versus apolombano. This is a one letter difference in Greek. This is, this is in 3 John verse 8. But in English, it tends to get reflected as totally different words, receive versus support. I could imagine a pastor wanting the people in his congregation to hear how similar the Greek words are, hupalambano, apolambano, as he's explaining the textual variant in his preaching passage. You know, it seems like they're so massively different, but you can see, or you can hear just by hearing these words, why scribes might have mistaken one for the other. Mike Tisdell came up with a parallel example in Hebrew, velo versus velo. These textual variants from Psalm 100 verse 3 sound the same but are spelled differently in Hebrew. He thought, and I agree, that this might be worth mentioning out loud to an English-speaking audience. I do indeed think church people need to hear about textual variants from us, from inerrantists, from pastors, before they hear about them from Bart Ehrman. But I put my money where my mouth is here. I personally, with the help of many volunteers, have translated pretty well all of the most significant textual variants into English in the New Testament at the KJB Parallel Bible site, soon to be available in Logos, by the way, though uh, shifted from the NA28 to the SBLGNT, just for those who want to know that. I think it will usually be more helpful to translate textual variants rather than recite them in Greek or Hebrew out loud in a sermon. But I totally see the value that this commenter and my friend Mike have pointed to, especially for places where textual variants are very similar sounding. Now to my three reasons why you may not want to mention Hebrew and Greek in the pulpit. I offer these humbly. Remember before you read, pastors, faithful are the wounds of a friend. I'd say 80% of the mentions of Greek that I hear in Bible teaching end up just restating what people already know from reading the English translations in their laps. So here's reason number one to consider not doing that. 
I'm an editor of Bible study articles, not just a writer of them. I received an article a few years ago that argued that the Greek word for believe, pistuo, in the Erasmian pronunciation, has a deeper meaning than the English one. So said the writer, the rest of whose piece was truly good. The Greek word was richer and more precise than the English word trust, he said. It meant to consider something to be true and therefore worthy of one's trust. But there are several problems with this utterly standard line of argument. The main one is that this line often just doesn't bear out when you look up the relevant English word. The contemporary English dictionary that I use most often defines trust as, quote, firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. That's the new Oxford American Dictionary. If anything, that sounds richer and stronger than the Greek word. It has the word firm in it, right? But of course, it isn't richer or stronger. Believing and disbelieving are things all humans do. The direct objects of the verb believe in the New Testament are most frequently Christian objects because the New Testament talks about believing Christ and God and the truth far more than it talks about believing a mere human's words or testimony to something. It is also true that believed by itself with no object comes to be used in the New Testament as a shorthand for believe the gospel. The context of the New Testament, in other words, fills in the missing direct object of belief. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Acts 11 doesn't have to say what they believed in. And believers comes to be a word for the early Christians without having to specify believers in the gospel. Here's another verse. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. That's Acts 19.18. But none of this means that the Greek word pistuo somehow means Christian belief inherently, or belief in the gospel, or belief in God. It takes specific context for the words to communicate that particular meaning. Linguists call this the pragmatic usage of a word. English is precisely the same way, or the two translations that I just gave of those verses in Acts would not work. Nobody would say that believe in English is a specifically Christian word. But nonetheless, people make perfect sense of the two verses that I just read, believed and believers, without the object of belief needing to be specifically explicitly named. Context, again, does the naming. So, if you point out that the Greek word for believe means, and fill in any Greek lexicon's definition here, you'll only be saying believe in Greek means exactly the same thing that the English word and the translation in your lap means. I guess I'm just not sure how much that helps. Now, uh, after reading a lot of critical comments on my first piece, I did find myself thinking, well, doing this does remind people that they are encountering the Bible in translation, and that is a good thing. Often, people do forget this. Also, I found myself wanting to insist to critical readers that unnecessary mentions of Hebrew and Greek are far, far better than erroneous ones. They do very little harm. This is a very minor sin, if it's even a sin. I'm not on a crusade. Second reason to avoid explicit mentions of Hebrew and Greek, however, exegetical fallacies are a perennial danger for all of us. D.A. Carson's excellent little book, Exegetical Fallacies, will probably convict the heart and mind of any preacher or Bible teacher who is Bible nerdy enough to enjoy this YouTube channel. I love this book. Uh, I just love it. In it, he says something I quoted, but that I struggled to heed. Sustained negativism is highly calorific nourishment for pride. He's not trying to turn everybody into critics of other preachers. I think I fell into this trap, at least a little, with some lines in my original piece. Lines that I have cut from this video with the benefit of hindsight. All I can say is that I have resolutely and earnestly applied Carson's criticisms to myself before ever turning toward helping others get the motes out of their eye. Nonetheless, I have to be honest, I have heard many, many exegetical fallacies in sermons when preachers make explicit mention of Hebrew and Greek words. A few years back, I heard a preacher make particular mention of the fact that a given Greek word occurs only twice in the New Testament. But the point he drew from this fact, just it just wasn't true. Yes, that particular form of the root occurred only twice, but the word was eleenas, and anyone who knows basic New Testament Greek vocabulary will see immediately that this word, meaning merciful, stems from elaos, that root, commonly translated mercy. You know, this is a frequent word. That root shows up 78 times in the New Testament and 18 in the Septuagint, if you need to know. The preacher was not being dishonest or malicious, not in the least. His heart was in the right place.
But his argument just didn't quite work for those few people who could have even followed what he was saying in that room. I will stop here with examples and I'll simply urge everyone to read Carson's exegetical fallacies and apply it to your Bible teaching life. A third reason, to avoid explicit mentions of Hebrew and Greek words in your sermon or perhaps a question to ask yourself every time you think of doing this. Will this comment about Greek and Hebrew, the explicit mention, will it really help my hearers read their Bibles better? Maybe yes, I've already given circumstances in which this is the case. And again, even mentions of Hebrew and Greek that aren't strictly necessary for the interpretation of that passage can, can, <laughs> constitute a healthy reminder that we all have translations in our laps, that the ESV or NIV or whatever didn't come down out of heaven from God. But I do believe that good Bible teaching, before it is anything else, is first good Bible reading. Good Bible teaching, therefore, models good Bible reading. It teaches listeners implicitly and often explicitly how to read God's Word on their own. I think most mentions of Hebrew and Greek do not help most Christians read their Bibles better. That is my personal opinion from my experience, which is limited and not exhaustive and universal. May I talk for a minute about lay Bible reading? I, I don't deny that traditions outside of my own evangelical Protestantism have their strengths. I don't deny that my own evangelical Protestantism, Reformation Protestantism, has massive weaknesses and troubles, at least in the U.S. One of these is what Christian Smith has called pervasive interpretive pluralism. I acknowledge this and I account for it. We are all fallen and finite Bible interpreters. And in these last days, even after God has spoken to us by his Son, there are plenty of self-described evangelicals who will not endure sound doctrine. I just figure that the group that emphasizes personal Bible reading and study at least has a chance to ameliorate their weaknesses, our weaknesses, and to repent of our troubles, to be reformed by the Word. So I want my pastor to preach the Bible using reading methods that are basically replicable by my 12-year-old. He's now 13. And I've seen this work in myself. I should get an ironic 90s throwback hipster t-shirt that says, hooked on expository preaching worked for me. Long before I had a call to ministry and became an inveterate theological scribbler, I was a teenage graphic design major who was thrilled to hear careful scriptural exposition through the book of Ephesians. That same preacher preaching through Ephesians, still preaching to this day, said more than once that expository preaching is caught as much as taught and I caught it. I read the Bible with more skill, knowledge, and confidence. And I hope also humility, because I was hearing careful preaching. I do think that hearers need to be reminded that they are reading the Bible in translation. I keep saying this. I, of all people, know the damage that accrues when people start to treat the translation in their hands as itself perfect and inspired. But this can be done without explicitly mentioning a Hebrew or Greek word. It can be done in a replicable way. You can say the Greek word that is translated exult here is also used repeatedly in the New Testament to mean something more like boast. That's something that my mentor often did. I am far from devaluing the original languages of scripture. I use them practically every day, but I think their use needs to be more subtle, more structural and skeletal, less on the surface for it to be effective rather than counterproductive or just unnecessary in a pastoring context. You'd be surprised how often I use Greek without mentioning it. It helps me spot contextual connections that I can then point out in the English. And it gives me word pictures. For example, my last name Ward is a borrowing from the same French root that gave us guard. Different regions of France, I am told by the History of English podcast, pronounced that same initial, uh, that, that same word differently because the initial consonant was different for them. So you've got Ward and guard. Anyway, so my ears perked up recently when a preacher friend of mine said that guard the good deposit entrusted to you was, and I will quote him to the best of my recollection, it was from fulasso, a military word, he said, meaning to guard. When he asked for my feedback later, now he asked, okay, he asked, I told him that he could have made the same point more safely without appeal to Greek, without explicit mention of it. He could have said, Paul wanted Timothy to be like a soldier vigilantly protecting precious valuables. No mention of Greek was necessary. No implication that what the word guard really means is something military. It isn't. No more than the English word guard is always something military. Instead, he could have used the metaphor that was baked into the Greek word to provide 
just an idea for a brief illustration, anecdote, metaphor, or word picture. He would be using the Greek in his study rather well, but not mentioning it explicitly. By the way, I got this from Dr. Bob Bell at Bob Jones. Bible teachers, I encourage you to resist in general the temptation to mention Hebrew or Greek words explicitly in sermons. I want to end by saying that some of my very favorite preachers in the whole world have mentioned Greek. In fact, I have to say this out loud, my last three pastors did it on a somewhat regular basis. They did not commit those exegetical fallacies. They were very careful about it. And I still happily attended those services and willingly listened to those sermons and was greatly benefited by them. Again, I am not on a crusade, but I hope I've offered some thoughts that will be helpful to you and at least get you to pause and ask the question, will this truly be beneficial to my hearers if I mention explicitly this Hebrew or Greek word in this sermon?